really? So, it seems like Team Cherry is completely opposed to ever posting a blog post again. I think they're scared. Their website crashes every time a new post goes up. In fact, their website just crashed last month on the one year anniversary of their last blog post, simply because Hollow Knight fans were hoping for an update and constantly refreshing the page. But it appears Team Cherry has found a medium that is impervious to server crashes. Print media. Hence, our latest batch of Silksong news comes from Edge Magazine. They are based out of the UK and have been around since 1993. Their 100th issue even had cover art drawn by Shigeru Miyamoto himself, best known as a producer on the game Wii Music. And now we have issue 354, which includes an interview from Team Cherry about Silksong, and has two cover arts drawn by Ari Gibson himself. This article was written by Jen Simpkins, who has actually interviewed Team Cherry before back in Edge issue 329, where they discussed Hollow Knight's development. But this new article contains heaps of new information and screenshots regarding Silk Song. There's a link in the description where you can purchase a single digital issue of the magazine, which I highly recommend so you can read the article in full for yourself. Buying a copy also helps legitimize indie games as being worth writing cover stories about. One of the first topics discussed in this article is why exactly Team Cherry decided to make Silk Song a completely separate game from Hollow Knight, as opposed to just a DLC. And the reason is because Hornet is too damn tall. The Knight is a little shrimp compared to Hornet, and due to her more acrobatic style, higher jumps, and weightier feel, Team Cherry felt like she would be too cramped maneuvering throughout the corridors of Hollow Nest, which is sort of funny to think about. Hollow Nest is already considered one of the largest Metroid Mania maps out there, and yet it feels too claustrophobic for Hornet. According to William, it took them a year and a half to fully understand how much Hornet's height affects designing for her. Another interesting tidbit of information is that Team Cherry wants to make Silk Song as accessible as possible, and by that I mean people can play Silk Song without playing Hollow Knight first. So it seems like Team Cherry wants to have a bit of a barrier between the events of Silk Song and Hollow Knight so new players don't get completely confused. In general, that's probably a good idea. But honestly, I would have preferred if new players were required to watch all of my videos before even being allowed to play Silk Song. Maybe a password on the opening title screen asking what my favorite color is, or how many warrants I have, stuff like that. Another thing Team Chain mentioned is that they want Silk Song to match Hollow Knight in terms of difficulty as well. So the early areas of Silk Song are supposed to be similarly easy compared to the early areas of Hollow Knight. Now while waiting in line for the Silk Song demo at PAX Australia, I saw plenty of people absolutely getting destroyed by the Moss Grotto area. But then again, people struggled with the Forgotten Crossroads too. So it's kind of hard for me to judge whether what I played was actually easier or harder than the early Hollow Knight areas. That being said, late game Silk Song probably won't shy away from cranking up the difficulty, as well as giving us some lore connections to Hollow Knight. Like, there has to be. I'm still waiting for a resolution to Bretta. However, it appears the enemies in Silk Song are going to be more sophisticated. We could already see that in the E3 demo, with these simple bell enemies already showing off a bit more dynamic interactions. But in this interview, Team Cherry specifically points out that some of the enemies in Hollow Knight feel very video gamey like the sentries in the City of Tears. With Silk Song, they feel like the enemies of the world should be more dynamic and aware of their surroundings. Ari says that they have spent more time focusing on combat over platforming with Silk Song, due to Hornet having more weight and less hang time. But that's enough about vague game design decisions. Let's talk about what we actually learn about Farloom in this interview. To get a brief overview, Farloom has been described as a land haunted by Silk and Song, and many have visited the land in a pilgrimage to make it to the Shining Citadel at the top of the kingdom. One thing we learned from this Edge article is that pilgrims are actually carrying precious thread up to the citadel, and that they will actually attack other pilgrims on the way for some reason. Also, the kingdom is littered with gates that can only be opened by paying melodic tributes, although that was something we already speculated. Apparently, Hornet has become weakened due to her time trapped in the sealed cage we saw in the intro, which might explain why she passes out after the Moss Mother fight. Ari explains this in a pretty alarming statement. Part of what Hornet's doing is she's lost her traditional strength, and the Weavers, or what's left of them, are helping her restore it. 
So what exactly is Hornet's traditional strength? Is it just her physical strength? Did she lose her spidey sense or some shit? And then there's what's left of the weavers. That does not sound good. From screenshots and the Edge article, we can tell that the weavers are residing in chambers here in Farloom, possibly behind these, but we don't know. Are they trapped in these locations, or are they hiding so they don't get taken to the citadel? The floor in this room is identical to that of the weaver's den in Hallownest, so it is most likely a location built by weavers. Since the pilgrims are bringing threads up to the citadel, it seems like a safe bet to assume that these bugs want silk so would probably want to capture weavers. Hence, some of them are hiding or are protected by these gates. So what exactly are these bugs doing with this silk? Well, I mentioned in my first Silk Song video an idea that bugs below the citadel are being controlled by silk some way, sort of like puppets. And since then, people have pointed out that when enemies die in Silk Song, we can briefly see long silk threads above them. This phenomenon is consistent and definitely intentional by the developers. Another thing I think we can say fairly confidently is that the name Farloom is actually pretty literal. In this image we can clearly see silk running together in lines, with these bindings that appear to be like forks used in actual looms. So the bugs of the citadel are collecting silk from weavers and pilgrims to add to their giant loom, which in turn they use to do something that results in the citizens of the kingdom being haunted by silk, or something like that, I'm not sure. One thing we do know is that the weavers grant Hornet the ability to use power-ups, one in particular being the Silk Spear, which allows Hornet to break through web barriers. My guess is that this move is a Silk Spear, although it's described as a lunging move, while this is more of a stabbing move. So the weavers will probably hold power-ups that Hornet will need to reach new areas in standard Metroidvania fashion. From the interview, we also learn a bit more about the structure of Farloom, Hornet starts off in the Moss Grotto, like we suspected, but after that the next area is actually the Bone Forest area that was cut from Hollow Knight. In this area we can find Bone Bottom, which is pretty much the main hub of the game, similar to Dirtmouth. Also, the fast travel tunnels are called the Marrow, and this creature we have to tame is called the Bell Beast. After getting the Silk Spear, Hornet can free the Bell Beast, who immediately attacks her, but if she is defeated, the Bell Beast ends up running away implying that you won't be able to fast travel in Silk Song until later in the game. Since we're talking about the structure of Farloom, let's take a look at some of the screenshots provided in this interview. Nothing we see here appears to be new areas. This Moth Grotto screenshot gives us a look at a new enemy. I've seen a few people call this creature a Moth Deer. Now I don't know why, but I just think this guy's neat. We also see Hornet playing music for this Kratos cosplayer. Why is she doing this exactly? Is Hornet one of those assholes who always brings their instruments to parties and just starts playing them? We can also see that Team Cherry has added some new statues into the background of locations we have already seen. These statues are of bugs looking upwards and holding what appear to be symbols. So what does this mean? Are they expecting something from the Citadel to come down to them? Are they offering something up? Something interesting about these statues is that there is actually a very similar one hidden in the God Home art assets in Hollow Knight. Although this thing doesn't have a face, so I don't know if it's looking up or not. We also appear to get a lot of images of Greymoor, which you might remember Team Cherry saying was one of the largest areas they've ever made. Now, we don't know if these rooms are actually Greymoor, but I'm assuming so because these areas are gray. Also, I think this room with the shopkeep is Greymoor too, simply because it has a similar floor. In this room, which appears to be to the left of one of the Bell Cities, we can see Hornet in a swamp-like area. What's interesting about this room are these weird stalactites hanging from the ceiling. Now, these might be giant plant or tree roots hanging from above. These small branches jetting out from the sides might be similar to taproot systems. Another theory is that these are man-made, or bug-made, I guess. Whatever these are, I really like them. They remind me of the Ash Lake from Dark Souls, or that cave seen in Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. Details like this and the aforementioned statues really help to emphasize Farloom's verticality. We can also see this in the new screenshot of that weird bell city. You basically have to jump on this thing to climb up the vertically stacked bell houses. Seems like a pretty dangerous place to live, but maybe the bugs of Farloom are really into parkour. In this screenshot, we do get a glimpse of Farloom's written language. This sign appears to be littered both with musical notes and gilded pins. 
Now it's possible that this is just how the language of Farloom is written, indicating how important music is here. We can also see what appears to be some musical notes on the lore tablets and deep docs. But other glimpses we've seen of Farloom's language look pretty similar to Hollow Knight's random scribbles. There are some tablets in Hollow Knight that appear to make sense, such as the stag station signs. If you stare at this long enough, you can kind of see what it's saying. So this sign might just be specific to this building. Or in other words, this building is a shop that sells musical instruments and pins. Finally, in this image, we can see that members of the Citadel's cast can use silk as well. Good for them. Getting back to the interview, we also learn that getting to the Citadel isn't quite the end goal of Silk Song, as once you get there, getting to the top of the Citadel is a task of its own. So the actual amount of time spent in the Citadel will be a greater portion of the game's runtime than we might have thought. So maybe some of the areas we have already seen are actually in the Citadel already. I do think it's possible that this area we've seen several times is actually located inside the Citadel. What's more interesting is that this room in the Trobeo boss fight has structures that look similar to the buildings found in the Citadel, if this is the Citadel. So the top of the Citadel might actually be this giant ball thing. Although I'm starting to think that this ball might actually be a silk cocoon of some kind. But at this point I'm just speculating wildly. William mentions that magic is a more distant thing in Farloom, which I have a bit of trouble understanding. I think he means that a lot more things in Farloom will look constructed, like traps and mechanisms and whatnot. Like instead of a snail shaman exploding and the knight just slurping up its life juice, Hornet will actually find objects and tools to upgrade her kit. But while Soul might not be as prevalent here in Farloom, I feel like all this stuff with Silk and Song still falls under the definition of magic. But maybe that's just me. We also learned about another mechanic with rosaries. We've seen before items called rosary strings, which Hornet can find. Basically when you die, you lose rosaries. But if you have rosary strings, those stick around. And then you can break them whenever you need to spend them. So it's basically like a more flexible version of the relics in Hollow Knight. But now it turns out you can actually create rosary strings from your own rosaries. A vendor might charge Hornet 120 rosaries to put 100 rosaries on a string. I think the Geo system in Hall Knight suffered from players losing thousands of Geo in the early game and getting frustrated, and it could be quite a while before the player ever found Millibel. So having this rosary system that allows the player to easily store their wealth at a small cost seems like a pretty good change to the currency system. Ari goes on to say that rosary strings can also be made at certain special benches. Speaking of benches, apparently this bench from the deep docks, with all these bells, is considered a holy bench, and that Ari has already designed like a hundred different benches for Silk Song. Now this statement is pretty eye-raising for multiple reasons, so let's dive into this. First of all, a hundred different benches is probably hyperbole. Since 100 isn't an exact number, that being said however, how many benches are there in Hollow Knight? If we count the additional breakable bench in Beast Den, the three benches in the White Palace, and the three non-Pantheon benches in Godhome, there are a total of 49 benches in Hollow Knight. So if there are already 100 different benches in Silk Song, that implies that Team Cherry has become much more generous with bench placement this time around, which I doubt, or Silk Song is twice as big as Hollow Knight. But it's worth pointing out that a lot of these 49 benches are not different, as a lot of them are just generic benches. So how many different bench designs are there in Hollow Knight? Well, there's the generic one, the toll bench, the benches found inside trams, the one in the ancestral mound, the one found outside Zalubra's hut, the one in the stone sanctuary, the one near the lake of Un, the one found near Leg Eater, which is more of a corpse than a bench, but I'm counting it anyway, the one in the Mantis Village, three slight variations found near the Nail Masters, the one in the Pleasure House, the one in the tent near Hornet 2, the one in the Coliseum of Fools, the one in the Teacher's Archives, the one found in Beast Den, the one found in front of the Pale King statue in the Queen's Garden, the ones unique to the White Palace, the one found in the Temple of the Black Egg, and two different ones found in God Home. Also, we can find two unused benches in the game's art assets. This bench, which can be found in a room called Hornet's Room, and a bench literally composed of fucking vessel corpses. Like seriously, this is the best bench ever and I'm so mad Team Cherry didn't use it. This puts the total of unique bench designs at 24. So Silk Song might have four times as many unique benches, which means Silk Song might actually be four times bigger than Hollow Knight. 
Now, I don't actually believe that. I'm guessing that Team Cherry is just opting to make new benches more often. So far, we've seen eight benches in Silksong, with six of them being unique. So while I'm sure Silksong will have more benches than Hall Knight, I think a greater percentage of them will be unique. The other thing interesting with this quote is Ari Gibson's exact wording. Unsurprisingly, we ended up with like a hundred different benches. The fact that he said we ended up is pretty interesting. Does this mean they are done making area artwork? The finality implied in this statement might spell good news for an impending Silksong release. Now I don't want to build your hype up too much, but Silk Song is definitely coming out by the end of this week. Regardless, it's obvious that Team Cherry is still keen on playing very close attention to detail. For example, they've got Jack Vine working on things like having little rings be able to roll around for a while after you hit them. And I'm guessing he's responsible for small things like making these objects move more realistically. Speaking of these rings, they will be used to denote that Chakra is nearby. Chakra being this game's version of Cornifer. So these rings will act similar to Cornifer's discarded pieces of paper. It's also implied that we might be fighting Chakra at some point in the future, which unfortunately never happens with Cornifer. There's also some news on the fleas. Remember them? Well apparently, not only will they just be sitting around, but they can also get captured by other bugs somehow. So it seems like there will be more to collecting fleas than just finding a physical location which will hopefully make them a bit more interesting to collect than the grubs, since they were pretty much just always stuck in jars, sometimes guarded behind random enemies. Like, why the fuck does this guy care so much about guarding this grub? Trabio got mentioned in this interview. Basically, it's been confirmed that he's a bit of a klutz, with his fight being accompanied by goofy music. Also, he's named after and voiced by another developer that Team Cherry is friends with, Matt Trabiani. Matt worked on the game Hacknet, which even featured a song by Christopher Larkin himself. You can see Matt being interviewed along with Team Cherry in this event from Bit Summit back in 2018. So is this Matt Trabiani guy canonically a klutz in real life? Well, I did actually meet Matt when I went to PAX in 2019. He said he liked my videos, so he seemed like a pretty smart guy to me at least. Team Cherry also discussed quests in Silk Song. They confirmed that there will still be the traditional random quests you can stumble on like in Hollow Knight but that there is also an organized collection of quests that the player can find using quest boards. If you remember, there are at least four different types of known quests. Wayfarer, Hunt, Grand Hunt, and Gather. It seems like Team Cherry only showed off a Gather quest, which had the player collect moss berries to take to the Druid of the Moss Temple, which is the guy we saw from the reveal trailer. We can see moss berries placed in the E3 demo, but it turns out enemies can just be carrying moss berries around with them. Also, you can apparently jump into this cauldron, but it isn't a very good idea. We do see a screenshot of what might be a hunt or a grand hunt, where Hornet is fighting some strange creature alongside Garmin and Zaza. I don't know why, but whenever I see them, I assume it must be some kind of quest. But I suppose that's just speculation on my part. And now I think it's time we get into Hornet's tools, since we see a lot of crazy stuff going on in these screenshots. First of all, we can see that Hornet's HUD takes on three different versions. This is entirely new, as none of the gifts from 2020 had anything like this. So what are they? Well, the HUD actually changes appearance based on what crest Hornet is using. Here on the menu, we can see a new crest called the Reaper, which has twice as many slots as the Wanderer crest we saw before, and that crest design seems to line up with one of the HUD changes. From this, we can see that there are crests that allow you to have two weapons at once, and from other screenshots, we can see this in action. In the E3 demo, the R button was how you activated a tool, but it's not clear how it would work with two of them. The L and ZL buttons weren't mapped in the demo, so those might be candidates for possibly using a second tool or changing the tool order. It's also possible for tools themselves to be upgraded, as the straight pin can later be upgraded to the tri pin. Apparently, Hornet can even learn to make new tools based on the tools used by the residents of Farloom, like seeing an enemy throw a javelin can help her learn to throw a javelin, which, okay. I'm sure it will make more sense when we see it in game. Also, she'll add her own little touch to them. This is shown off pretty well in this screenshot. You can see Hornet using the same tool as this NPC, except it has a red rope on it. So what new tools can we see in these screenshots? As we can see here, Team Cherry has finally given Hornet a boomerang. 
I know Team Cherry's Australian audience was pretty upset at the lack of boomerangs in Hollow Knight, so this is a welcome addition. Now if they could just add a gun, then us Americans will finally feel represented. We've got some kind of container full of orange liquidy goop. I'm sure that's not harmful at all. I think this is a grenade of some kind, maybe similar to the Pimpillo. We can also see this longer spear weapon and a drill type weapon. But then we also see another drill type weapon without a handle. Now according to Ari, there is another drill attack where Hornet becomes something like a spinning top and descends towards enemies. I don't think either of these items are related to that though. It could be this red drill, but we have yet to see a tool like this directly affect Hornet's movement. From an earlier gif we can see another way Hornet's air movement can be altered. We can see her glide in the air, and I'm guessing this is yet another part of Hornet's kit that can be altered, possibly via crests. Maybe you can choose between giving her a double jump, or a glide, or turning into a fucking Beyblade. Also we got a name for this tool. It's called a Sting Shard. There are some other new tools here in the menu, but we still have no idea what these things do. I still think these are passive effects. In this screenshot we can see spikes around Hornet's masks, which might imply she's wearing a Thorns of Agony type tool. But nothing in the interview directly mentions it. But one thing we do know is that Team Cherry is adding sub reactions to these tools. By that I think they mean stuff like how charm abilities would combine in Hollow Knight. Basically, tools will have unique interactions depending on the context in which they are used. There's another part to these crests that I still need to mention, and that's how it appears that you can actually equip Hornet's abilities to a crest. From this screenshot, we can see this image, presumably of Hornet's needle, sitting in the middle of the crest. Then if we look above the red section tools, we can see another image of Hornet's needle. So it seems like Hornet's silk abilities can be swapped out. So you can maybe have this big slash move equipped, or the Gazimir Storm, or this stabbing move. And judging from the layout of the controls, these will be called skills. Another interesting change is that the crest we see in the screenshot doesn't have the slots colored like in a previous example. Although there is still some color here, so I'm not sure what that's about. Moving away from crests, I have just one more thing to say about the UI in regards to the spool meters. It seems like these systems have changed since the E3 demo. The lower spool meter now has a base length of 9 silk notches instead of 8. Also we can see that the spool is now segmented. It appears there is always a mark to denote the first 9 notches, but sometimes there are other smaller marks at around 5 notches. It also seems like the silk will glow brightly after it hits 9 notches, except in this screenshot where it lights up at 8. This might be related to whatever mark the silk has reached on the spool. We can see the upper spool meter is also segmented in some cases. Also we can see from these screenshots that this spool meter doesn't light up once Hornet reaches 8 notches of silk anymore. At first I thought maybe it only lights up when you have lost health, basically as an indicator that you can use Hornet's bind ability to heal. So a segmented meter means that with a full spool of silk, you'd be able to bind multiple times as long as you didn't reach full health. But in the gifts released last summer, we can see the meter both lit and not lit while Hornet has full health. So either this gif is outdated, or my theory is dead ass wrong. Regardless, it's safe to say that the segments on these meters, or whether or not they are lit up, is likely determined by whatever abilities and tools Hornet has equipped to her crest. Other than that, it might be possible that Hornet can increase the length of her spool via collectibles like the soul vessels from the first game. But I've spent too long looking at these stupid fucking screenshots and I still can't pin down exactly what's going on, so I'm gonna drop it for now. Now just a few more things to mention. Apparently the lace song we've all come to know and love wasn't what Christopher Larkin originally wrote. The first song he wrote was the result of Team Cherry trying to explain the lore and backstory to him. They ended up using a different piece that he had just written as a boss theme. So it sounds like Team Cherry is kinda just gonna let Chris do his own thing. Which, given Larkin's track record, it will probably be fine. So will we ever get to hear the original Lace theme? Well, as it turns out, I was able to actually get a copy of the song, so I'll play it for you right now. Also, we got an image of what appears to be a new boss. According to Ari, this boss is known as the Last Judge. William then says that this enemy immediately makes the player wonder what his deal is. And then the author of the magazine actually calls me out by name. I truly am honored to be mentioned in a UK based gaming magazine. 
I remember buying issue number one back in 1993 and thinking to myself how amazing it would be to get my name in Edge magazine. That was pretty much the whole reason I started this channel, and now my dream has finally come true. There's just one problem. They capitalized the M. <laughs> now, to be completely fair, Jen Simpkins informed me that she had to capitalize the M due to something called style guides. Sounds made up, but I think Jen is telling the truth here. In fact, Jen appears to be a pretty big Hollow Knight fan in general. She's even aware of the Milk Song meme, which started over on the Hollow Knight meme subreddit. If you don't know what the Milk Song memes are, or why they exist, well, neither do I honestly. Getting back to the actual screenshot, there is a bit to talk about here. First of all, for being a land without much magic, I'm pretty skeptical that this motherfucker isn't some kind of wizard. It's got the silly headwear, and it can make giant spirals of flames all over the place. Now this magic ability might be tied to the rosaries he appears to be clutching. Also if we look at his eyes, we can see streaks under them. Now in the early days of this channel, I always tied this to Void, but there are a lot of bugs and statues of bugs in Hollow Knight that have these streaks that don't appear to have anything to do with the Void, so I think this is more of a stylistic choice. So this might just be related to the Last Judge crying because all his other Judge friends are dead, hence the name Last Judge, but what exactly is this thing judging? Now we have seen that Farlam has some kind of prison system, as we can find Grendel locked away in a cell, but this bug doesn't quite seem like a law and order type judge, if that makes any sense. Maybe it judges whether or not pilgrims can enter the citadel, and if not, he torches them. It's also worth pointing out that this bug has a similar aesthetic to the bug Team Cherry showed us in their last blog post. It also looks similar to a bug found in the coral forest, and it's worth pointing out that we don't know for sure if these bugs are actually related to the bugs we see in the citadel. All we know is that this bug is a part of a scholarly suite, guarding a vault of ancient knowledge. So we actually don't know for sure if these guys are actually directly tied to what is going on in the citadel, although it's certainly possible and it probably is the case. Finally, Team Cherry was asked about what happens after Silksong. William and I talked a bit about a non-Hollow Knight related game that they have been thinking about. As of right now, this project consists of just a Google Doc that they add to every now and then as they work on Silksong. A strong candidate for what this game might be is Fearless Fox, a term Team Cherry trademarked back in 2019. It isn't guaranteed that this game will be a Metroidvania. In the past, William has expressed interest in doing a top-down 2D Zelda style game, but they did clarify that whatever games they will make will continue to have large sprawling worlds and interesting characters to interact with. So what does this mean for future Hollow Knight content? The only Hollow Knight content not directly produced by Team Cherry that we can consider canon is the Wanderer's Journal, which ultimately didn't add a whole lot to Hollow Knight's story, since it was just a character experiencing all the same stuff we did. According to Team Cherry's marketing director, Leth, Team Cherry has been approached by companies wanting to make Hollow Knight television shows and comics. Let's explain this on Live from the Abyss, a podcast created by two other Hollow Knight YouTubers, Deep Dark Proletarian and Mithril. We've been contacted by some companies wanting to make other media of Hollow Knight, like whether it be a cartoon or you know, show or comic book or what have you um it usually comes down to ari just not uh i don't know he and i i understand this you know i think it was basic like we don't want to corporatize the the franchise or... yeah not too much <laughs> so basically it seems like team cherry really wants to avoid turning hall Knight into some giant franchise with books and shows and all sorts of other crap and who could blame them? That's a really good way to completely screw up your fictional world and make it less special. I mean, Cuphead's deep and comprehensive lore will no doubt be ruined by their upcoming Netflix show, which is a damn shame. So it seems like Silk Song might mark the end of Hollow Knight content for a while, unless Team Cherry decides to make Zope Boat or changes their mind on third party stuff. But honestly, I think Team Cherry will do at least one other Hollow Knight related thing other than Silk Song. Call it a feeling, call it speculation, but I feel like William and Ari are so invested in this world and the fact that they can't stop adding to it makes me think that there will be other Hollow Knight content coming out. 
or maybe I'm just in denial. You decide. And so that's about all I have to say regarding this interview. We learned a little bit more about the crest system and the world layout, and we got a little more information about characters like the Bell Beast and Chakra. But I think what was most interesting is how different Silk Song has been development wise. Team Cherry had to make rooms bigger and adjust the game's camera just to accommodate Hornet's playstyle, as well as create more complex enemies for her to fight. I am a little bummed to hear that Team Cherry has been focusing less on platforming, since Hornet seems really well equipped for that kind of stuff. One thing that still eludes us is a full explanation on how exactly some tools alter Hornet's playstyle, other than they seem to affect her silk meters in some way. Lore-wise, we learn that pilgrims are actually bringing thread to the Citadel, and that they will even attack other pilgrims. We've also learned that Hornet's time in her cage has zapped her of her traditional strength, and she now has to find the weavers to get it back. But there are still many questions left regarding Lace, this conductor Romeo fellow, the Steel Assassins, as well as who is running this whole operation, and if any of this will tie back into what we saw in the cliffhanger endings from Hollow Knight. Yeah, remember those? Fucking cliffhangers, man. I swear to god, I hate it when they just abruptly cut things off right when